Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. The death of a young child was a very real and emotional experience for many families during the American Progressive Era. However, at the dawn of the 20th century, many Americans came to expect a better outcome in the life expectancy of their children. In the new age of industrial capitalism, with rapidly changing technology, medical professionalization, and increasing wealth, Americans could have had the lowest percentage of child and infant deaths out of all industrializing nations. This was, however, not the case. In 1900, America ranked 10th among principal nations in infant mortality. The estimated national infant mortality rate was 100 per 1,000 live births, which is really high, Mm -hmm. um, resulting in over 230,000 infant deaths per year. The maternal mortality rate was 15,000 women per year, which is also really high. The actual numbers were probably much higher as official data was never exact. The United States did not have a uniform system in place to register births. And just to put this in perspective, in 1900, there were 76 million people in the United States. Now we have 323 million people living in the U.S. So these infant mortality numbers were significant in 1900 seeming even higher because there's fewer people. Right. Um, subsequently, the pain and loss of a child was an element that touched almost every American living in the early 20th century. This series, we are taking the opportunity to share with our listeners what we research and write about. So each each producer is doing a little episode on our own research, right? And so today it's my turn, this is Elizabeth, um, to talk a little bit about what I'm focused on historically and what my research and writing is all about. So get ready for a discussion of women's political organizing in the late 19th and early 20th century in the face of high infant mortality rates. I'm Elizabeth garner Mazurik, And I'm Marissa Rhodes. And we are your historians for this episode of DIG. Statistic. Because the United States didn't have a system in place to adequately register births, the number of infant deaths were never exact. In fact, the chief statistician of the Government Board of Vital Statistics deplored the inadequate birth registration efforts of the United States. There were pockets in America, like New York City, that were working towards more accurate birth records, but the majority of states had no systematic programs to gather the data. Very rural areas in the U.S. were the least accounted for. On one hand, this was a result of federalism. Each state had different systems, or none at all, in determining accurate infant birth and death rates. Another reason infant mortality was not accurately tracked was that there was no central organizing board to do the calculations. The Census Bureau counted the population every 10 years, but didn't implement protocols for registering every infant birth between each census. Alternatively, by the 1910s, numerous industrial countries had already enacted programs to document and prevent infant and maternal mortality. Regardless of the statistical data, millions of women lost their babies within the first year of life during the early 20th century. This acted as a motivating factor for many women to organize around infant and maternal mortality and the deeply gendered aspect of this problem. The issue of child welfare gained prominence in the late 19th century, building upon the antebellum voluntary women's activism in the abolition movement, and then later temperance and the suffrage movements. A vast movement of female reformers built a network of women focused on child welfare. Many of these reform-minded women founded charity-based organizations to help alleviate poverty among immigrants and the poor. Many also focused on women's issues and the issues of child health and mortality. The movement to create a national agency that would collect and disseminate information regarding the welfare of children was spearheaded by two reformers with roots in the Settlement House movement, 
Lillian Wald was the founder of the Henry Street Settlement in New York City and led the campaign to establish the New York City Bureau of Child Hygiene. She was a lifelong advocate for access to medical care for the rich and poor alike and actually developed the concept of public health nursing. Florence Kelly, a labor rights and children's rights advocate who founded the National Consumers League in 1909, lived and worked in Chicago's Hull House settlement before moving to New York City and joining the Henry Street Settlement. In 1903, Wald and Kelly enlisted the aid of Edward T. Devine, a longtime political associate of President Theodore Roosevelt, to introduce the idea of a federal children's bureau to the president. Roosevelt famously replied, bully, come down and tell me about it. Because I love thinking of TR always saying bully, (laughs) bully for you. So bully, come down and tell me about it. (laughs) And so Wald Devine, Jane Addams and Mary McDowell, another former Hull House resident, met with the president to argue their case. What they needed, they said, uh, was a physical bureau in Washington that could coordinate information pertaining to child welfare. Numerous charity organizations across the country were involved in programs to alleviate infant mortality, child working conditions, and family poverty, but there was no central agency to bind their efforts together. The states and private organizations were not capable of enacting real changes on their own. They needed a central organizing authority backed by federal dollars to organize child welfare efforts. The Children's Bureau would become a clearinghouse in which separate studies and programs could be analyzed, organized, and acted upon under one roof. Roosevelt privately endorsed the idea, but declined to publicly endorse the program until years later. Many advocates for small government felt that the government had no authority to distribute persuasive data, or propaganda as they called it, regarding health and child welfare. Homer Folks, secretary of the State Charities Aid Association of New York, believed that would, it would be a mistake for the, quote, Federal Children's Bureau to take on many of the things that would be extremely proper and extremely desirable for a voluntary association to undertake. James E. West, secretary of the National Child Rescue League, argued that, quote, it is not the function of a government body to do promotional work. So instead, what they wanted to see was some kind of governing board that was organized on a voluntary basis. So essentially kind of all of these charities kind of coming together and really not having any kind of federal authority. Um, Alternatively, proponents of the Federal Bureau saw federal action as the only means of systematically collecting and distributing the enormous amounts of data that needed to be collected and analyzed. Individual states and scattered charity organizations had thus far not been able to collect data that could be utilized for national purposes. Therefore, a centralized federal bureau, in their opinion, was the only option that was a workable solution. Sorry, that just reminds me when people, you know, argue for an increase in SNAP benefits or something. People are like, oh, aren't there churches who can do this exactly. work? And it's like, ew, f- it's you. A, it's, a, it's a constant argument in any kind of welfare program, this, this argument. Um federal backing versus voluntary organizing. And right. So it's, 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 you know, and so it's amazing to like go back, you know, even as far back as you go and then this, you know, progressive era and then you look in the 1970s, it's the same argument, argument, and you saw it, you saw it again in the, mm-hmm. um, the depression or the recession of 2008, um, you know, but yep. then in things like the Great Depression in the 30s and the Great Recession in 2008, the problem is that those charity organizations get overwhelmed when mm-hmm. something could, you know, like super catastrophic happens. And that's when it really becomes evident to a lot of people that voluntary just can't cover the needs. Right. right? And they can't always work together and they can't, you know, they, they don't have a a head to direct them. Right. So, um, women were largely behind the organizing efforts for creating a federal children's bureau, a web of women's voluntary organizations, including the national consumers league, the general federation of women's clubs, which is called, um, the GFWC, the National Congress of Mothers, and the Daughters of the American Revolution, uh, known as the DAR, and many others finally created enough public momentum and interest to get Congress to pass a bill creating the U.S. Children's Bureau. 
Yet there were still some charity reformers and politicians who were opposed to the formation of the Bureau. Some of these opponents, citing fears of government bureaucracy, large salaries, and infringement on states' rights, editorialized in the New York Times and other such platforms about the dangerous scheme, right? This, this dangerous scheme that they were coming up with. And they feared that the Bureau would, quote, invade rights which have existed since the foundation of the national government and are by its constitution entrusted to the individual states. So essentially, again, this kind of state's rights, they're afraid of any kind of large federal bureaucracy that is going to be able to dictate what states can do. Right. However, there were many who were glad to see the formation of the Bureau. The New York Times published an article applauding the formation of the Children's Bureau, which highlighted the need for a unified front aimed at children's welfare. Up until the formation of the Bureau, reform efforts geared towards children had been piecemeal or, as the Times stated, quote, split up into bits and has therefore been insoluble, end quote. As much as charity organizations had previously devoted to the alleviation of poverty and suffering, they had thus far not been able to gather significant statistical information to make real nationwide change in the health and well-being of children. Thousands of letters poured into the Children's Bureau after its formation, chronicling women's fears over the proper care of their children. Thousands more wrote in describing their grief and pain over the loss of a child or the paltry gynecological health that they lived with because of inadequate postnatal care. A cursory look at a study commissioned by the Charity Organization Department of the Russell Sage Foundation um, found that 985 widows and their families showed that almost half of the mothers surveyed experienced the death of a child. So out of 985 women, half of them had, had lost a child. So the death of children, especially infants, was a visceral reality to many American women. The first major effort undertaken by the Children's Bureau was a focus on curbing infant mortality. The Bureau investigated health and hygiene, milk supply, economic conditions, and all sanitary conditions concerning children under one year old within designated areas of study. Additionally, the Bureau enacted a door-to-door -door campaign to collect birth records. Thousands of women connected with the network of voluntary women's organizations and took on government work as volunteers for the Bureau. Women from the National Congress of Mothers, the GFWC, the DAR, and other such organizations prepared committees to knock on doors with copies of standardized birth certificates. So the director of the Bureau, Julia Lethrop, stated the women volunteers, quote, carefully filled them out for a certain number of babies in their neighborhoods. They then compared these records with those in the local registrar's office, end quote. These records were then sent to the Children's Bureau for analysis. This massive collection of data allowed the Bureau to create regions where they knew the birth and subsequent death rates of children in particular areas. Over 3,000 club women participated in registration efforts in 1915, designating 10 states and the District of Columbia as, quote, birth registration areas, where there was an accurate birth and death record of all babies born. By 1933, this included all states. The majority of this footwork was performed by voluntary members of women's clubs across the country. These women physically went neighborhood to neighborhood and door to door to collect data. And as they traveled through these landscapes, they spoke with women in their communities about the importance of birth registration. They helped spread consciousness pertaining to infant mortality, something that so many women had previously faced alone or within their insulated families. These women's voluntary efforts to collect this data and speak with other women about their experience with infant health and mortality is the perfect example of making the personal political. So much of women's experience was relegated to the private sphere, and this was bringing it out into the public. But the Children's Bureau did not rely on volunteer labor alone, but employed a cadre of female social workers and statisticians. The Bureau conducted eight intensive studies between 1912 and 1918 that focused on the infant mortality rates in cities ranging from 24,000 people to half a million. Bureau employees, almost exclusively women, conducted these sociological field studies by traveling to the respective cities of study. A study in Montclair, New Jersey, found that overall the infant death rate in Montclair in 1915 was 84.6 per 1,000, whereas the national rate was estimated at 124 per 1,000 live births for 1910. So 
slightly better, right? right? A slight improvement. Um, on closer inspection, however, the fourth ward area of town, which housed the most tenement dwellers and low-income families, had an infant mortality rate of 134 per thousand live births. This was one of many such studies that linked poverty with higher infant mortality rates. The report concluded, quote, a low income frequently must involve undesirable housing accommodations, an overworked mother, insufficient nourishment for mother and child, and lack of competent medical advice, end quote. The report wasn't linking infant mortality to a lack of medical care per se, but the unequal access to the resources necessary for raising healthy offspring. This type of bureau field study was conducted in cities and towns across the nation and usually accessed the expertise of local public health nurses for each locality. Many Children's Bureau reports showed that poverty had a direct correlation to infant mortality, but it was not the sole determining factor. Middle and upper class women also suffered from infant death or poor maternal health after delivery. Women across the country participated in the Children's Bureau reform efforts by actively requesting and reading pamphlets printed by the Bureau. Roughly 1.5 million copies of prenatal care, which started printing in 1913, and infant care, that started in 1914, were distributed widely between 1914 and 1921. Letters written into the Children's Bureau from mothers requesting the pamphlets or asking clarifying questions regarding the pamphlets proved their popularity. These letters show that mothers of every class and level of education were reading the pamphlets and engaging in the dissemination of government-sponsored scientific literature. Some letters written to the Bureau ask very specific medical questions that the writer either didn't want to speak to her male doctor about or were sent to the Bureau because it was the only place she could acquire medical advice. One woman wrote, quote, My baby's eyes have been sore, but no one worried but myself, and I did only because I had read of the danger of blindness in your books. No one here ever saw a doctor do anything for a newborn baby's eyes, end quote. Through reading and sharing Children's Bureau pamphlets, many women circumvented their physical landscape that might be devoid of physicians or openly hostile to modern scientific ideas on child rearing. In fact, some of the letters written to the Children's Bureau showed the anger that women felt over the death of children, which they felt was entirely preventable. A well-off woman wrote about the death of her baby son and the inadequate medical advice she received. Quote, my baby was sacrificed through mere ignorance. This happened in the capital of Illinois, and money or efforts were not spared to save him. I soon found that not only mothers of large families knew nothing about the scientific care of babies, so she's a little bit snobby right there, mm -hmm. but the best doctors in the city knew less. I could not nurse my baby, and he just faded away, never gaining or rather losing weight all the time on the many foods which the different doctors tried. End quote. So this grieving mother, along with thousands of others, became mobilized through their own experiences and those of their friends and acquaintances. They bemoaned the lack of trustworthy medical advice regarding pre- and postnatal care, even from their own doctors. They were looking for a way to exert some political authority over the care and management of children and maternal health in the United States. In fact, in 1965, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare estimated that one copy of infant care, continuously published since 1914, had been distributed for every three babies born in the past 50 years. The relationship between women that consumed Bureau publications and the women who ran the Bureau exponentially spread consciousness to women across the American landscape that maternal and infant health were important and worthy of state protection. As important as the dissemination of knowledge became, scientific studies performed by the Children's Bureau showed in stark numerical detail that infant mortality in America was appallingly high. For a country that prided itself on its wealth and high standard of living, a soaring infant mortality rate was unacceptable as it reflected a general lack of care for the poor and women and children in general. Lathrop was quoted as saying in a speech at the end of World War I, quote, we cannot help the world toward democracy if we despise democracy at home, and it is despised when mother or child die needlessly. Yikes. Much of women's voluntary organizing focused on the private sphere or domestic concerns, issues that were perceived to be part of a woman's domain, like maternal and child health, child rearing, nutrition, and education. 
But these issues inevitably drew women into partisan politics in the late 19th century as the lines between private and the public sphere blurred. Matters that were once perceived as private family concerns morphed into issues of public health and national concern as progressive era discontent with social ills grew. Women began lobbying in larger numbers for federal oversight of issues like health, education, sanitation, issues women had previously taken care of on a voluntary basis. Nonetheless, women's political activism spread further to include issues of anti-lynching, labor activism, birth control, civil rights, and other important problems. It is important to keep in mind that women or woman was not an all-encompassing term. Women's political organizing focused on many different aspects of American life, and some women's political organizing did not benefit other women. The historiography of women's reform and politics is vast. Additionally, contemporaneous ideas about health, fitness, and eugenics were all linked to ideas surrounding motherhood. So my research explores women's reform work concerned with the politicization of motherhood. It probes how women reformers from distinct demographics politically organized to address the health and vulnerability of women and children. Women's reform work is part of a broader study of women's political movements during the progressive era. Reform work for maternal and child health allowed many women opportunities to enter official channels of government, like women working in the U.S. Children's Bureau, for instance. Other notable exceptions were Florence Kelly in the labor movement, Jane Addams in the settlement house movement, and Ida B. Wells in the anti-lynching civil rights movement. Simultaneously and often overlapping was the women's suffrage movement. Women's reform work and the fight for suffrage are often treated as separate movements when in reality they were closely related. For example, women's suffrage and the abolition movement were connected from their earliest beginnings. Other reform movements also overlapped with suffrage like the temperance movement with the Women's Christian Temperance Union, um, you know, they, they greatly supported women's suffrage as well. Women's political action through reform work and the fight for suffrage are often treated as different types of politics in much of the literature. However, many reform organizations whose main priority was not women's suffrage either supported or condemned women's enfranchisement as a way to push forward their primary reform goals. So even without the vote, the very act of reform work in charitable and voluntary organizations organizations allowed women to enter the political sphere. Statistically speaking, infant mortality for American women as a whole has fallen dramatically since the early 20th century, but there is shocking disparity when broken down by race. Nationally, black infants die at much higher rates than white infants in the U.S. Although the Children's Bureau did investigate infant mortality based on race, their primary findings were that populations with higher rates of poverty had a greater percentage of infant mortality. This correlation between poverty and infant mortality still stands today, but examining the relationship between race and poverty is further highlighted in the disparate numbers between white and black infant mortality rates in America today. Nationally, 11.1 black infants die per 1,000 births in 2013, compared to 5.96 deaths for white babies in the same period, so almost double. Mm -hmm. For example, in Ohio, the rate of black infant mortality in 2013 was 13.57 per 1,000 births, the second highest nationally. The disparity in the Ohio numbers mirrored the national average where more than twice as many black babies died than white. According to the CDC, in the 39 states where this information could be calculated, nowhere was infant mortality equal among black and white babies. Yeah. Right. So judging for those, from those numbers, I mean, obviously infant mortality has gone down, but the U.S. is still one of the... Um, it still has one of the highest infant mortality rates among industrialized nations in the world, right? And it definitely breaks down by race and by income levels. Right. And the same with maternal mortality. Right. Like black mothers die at way higher rates. I think it's four times more often than uh, white mothers um, around the time of birth. Right. Which it's... is why. I'm obviously interested in this yeah. topic, right? Right. Right. So in summation, as a historian, I'm interested in the intersection of child health and mortality with women's reform work and the entrance of women into public and political roles on account of those issues. And on a grander scheme, I'm interested in how the American welfare state began to form in the early 20th century and the multitude of female reformers who were behind that push. So 
honestly, I first became interested in this topic when I myself got on welfare. It was right after the crash of 2008 and the company I worked for shut down. I was seven months pregnant. I waddled up to the place I worked, uh, showed up one day and they were just turning everyone away and locking the doors. So no severance pay, nothing. My, and my husband had lost his job two weeks earlier. So, you know, life really sucked there for a while. Um, and I was really angry and upset about how I was treated when I was trying to get a, a, on welfare. I was treated as, you know, somebody who was trying to game the system. I was repeatedly questioned about my financials and, you know, cars that I had owned like years previous, but no longer owned and just really all this nonsense. And I completely understood that I was experiencing this really shitty treatment that this was, and this was going on in Texas, just to be clear, um, that they were doing everything they could to keep me from getting any welfare benefits, even though we had no income and no savings. But, you know, I was struck with how hard the process was to get some help and how all of the gazillion forms I had to fill out confused me to no end. And I was thinking the whole time that, you know, here I am with my white privilege and my college education and all the benefits that I had going for me. And this is the most confusing, intimidating, confounding web of bullshit that I had ever experienced. And I couldn't even fathom how, you know, crappy this would be if I didn't have all of these, you know, benefits that I had on my side. And so it made me really angry and it made me get more political, involved more politically after that. And yes, I fully admit that this was something I never really even thought of until I had to experience myself. So that's kind of and how privilege works right there. Um, so I fully acknowledge that. But, you know, that was that's kind of my story. And that's why I'm interested in it. And then a year or so after all of that, I read a book by a political scientist, Eileen McDonough, McDonough, I think that's how you say your name, um, about why America lacks lags so far behind other democracies in our percentage of women in elected office. And that book introduced me to this term uh, maternalist or maternalism, which is a reference to to politics, um, it's the care work that people need after they are born, especially the young, the elderly, the ill or disabled. So maternalist in like a political sense is this working towards a state sponsored support um, of that needed care work. And so then I entered grad school and now I'm able to geek out about this stuff all the time. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of throw a couple of books at you that have kind of influenced my research a little more and kind of brought me further down this path. Um, so Gwendolyn Meek's The Wages of Motherhood, Theta Scotchpole's Protecting Soldiers and Mothers, Robin Muncy's Creating a Fe Female Dominion in American Reform, and Michelle Mitchell's Righteous Propagation. So those are all books that, if you're interested in this topic, are good kind of primers for getting yourself acclimated to the subject. And then, although it's not a book that is directly involved or directly tied to this topic, but it's just a book that I've found really influential as a graduate student, is Thomas Sugru's The Origins of the Urban Crisis. So I would recommend all of those if, if you like kind of thinking about, you know, race and politics and health and and how that is like distributed in America. Right. So either buy those and support the authors if you're able or support your local library and uh, <laughs> go and check one out. Yeah. Um, so thanks for listening. Please don't forget to leave us a five star review on iTunes, Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Pinterest for our latest episodes and other historical goodies. And join our Facebook group, Dig History Pod Squad, for cool conversations and excellent history memes if I do say so myself bye bye thank you never just read it okay it doesn't really make sense but that's okay other notable examples were <laughs> okay <laughs> um but the children's bureau did not rely on volunteer labor alone but employed a <laughs> I love that word I just can't say it go ahead did and say you have... Andre. it's fine okay what what are you weirding? I don't know. With the light on, the glow from your phone makes your face look really weird. Thanks. Um, I'm going to do that again. The National Congress of Mothers, uh, Daughters of the American Revolution, which we'll know, we know as the DAR because of Gilmore Girls, and <laughs> many other... Uh, they many... call it the DAR in the, in the Gilmore Girls? No, they are... Because um... usually it's DAR. Really? Yeah, they call it the DAR. That's funny. I mean, it can't... Is it usually DAR? 
I've only I've, I feel always, like I've, I've always heard it referenced as daughter. I mean, it you're is. southern. I'm I wouldn't know, well, but it's the daughters of the revolution, not the daughters of the I know, Tennessee. but it's more common in southern states, isn't it? Not necessarily. No, because they're in Connecticut and Gilmore Girls. Yeah. No, you're right. It's, I'm getting it's it mixed up. Daughters of the American Revolution. So it's like all fancy East Coast people. It's just it's just rich ladies that don't know anything better to do. Well, yeah, so they call it. <laughs> I swear that they call it the D A R. And and that's fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's um, it's just interesting. That's funny. So Gilmore Girls blowing minds. Mm-hmm.